On Sunday morning, an old cowboy entered a church just before the service began. The clothes he was wearing were a little scruffy. He wore jeans, a denim, denim shirt, and boots that were worn and ragged. In his hand, he carried a worn-out old hat and a worn-out Bible. The church he entered was in a very upscale and exclusive part of the city. It was the largest and most beautiful church the old cowboy had ever been in. The people of the congregation were well-dressed, with expensive clothes and accessories. As the cowboy took his seat, the others in the congregation moved away from him. No one greeted him, spoke to him, or welcomed him. They were all appalled by his appearance and did not attempt to hide it. The preacher gave a long sermon filled with fire and brimstone. As the old cowboy was leaving the church, the preacher approached him and asked the cowboy to do him a favor. He said, before you come back in here again, have a talk to God and ask him what he thinks should be the appropriate attire to come to worship. The old cowboy assured the, pre the preacher that he would. The next Sunday he came to the service wearing the old same ragged jeans, shirt, boots and hat, and once again he was completely shunned and ignored by the congregation. The preacher approached the man at the end of the service and said, I thought I asked you to speak to God about what you should wear before you came back to church. He said, I did. If you spoke to God, the preacher said, what did he tell you the proper attire should be for worshipping in here? Well, sir, God told me that he didn't have a clue what I should wear because he's never been here before. <laughs> the Bible teaches us that if God isn't here, really, we're not doing church. If God isn't here, if God isn't present, we can't truly worship God. If God isn't here, if God isn't present, we're wasting our time. The most important thing we need in worship is the presence of God. We need to God to be in our midst. For a few weeks now, we've been looking at the tabernacle, tabernacle that large portable tent structure at the cent, that, w that served as the center for worship for the Israelites as they traveled along their journey through the wilderness to the promised land. And this was the principal message of the tabernacle. It was the place where they worshipped God. It was a place where God's presence abided. That's why it was always placed directly in the middle of the Israelites when they encamped. Because God wanted them to realize he was in the midst. It served as the reminder of God's presence among his people. First of all, there was the outer court. That was the general meeting place where Jews uh, would do business at the table, tabernacle and were welcome. And in that section, you'd find the brazen, the brazen altar, the bronze or brazen wash basin or laven. The second area was the holy place. The holy place was the start of the tabernacle proper. This is the area where the priest performed a number of daily duties. In this section, you find the golden lampstand, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. And the third department was the Holy of Holies. That was sectioned off by a veil, a very big veil or curtain. And, and, and inside, you'd find one piece of furniture only, the Ark of the Covenant. And in this section, only the priest could enter and do so only once a year on the Day of Atonement. This morning, I want you to use your sanctified imagination for a few moments. I want you to imagine that you are a priest in the days of Moses. You've just been ordained. And this is your first day on the job. You enter the outer court. And offer sacrifices on the altar and, and wash your hands and feet in the brazen laver. And now you move into the second department, the holy place. It's very quiet here. You look around, you see the light from the lampstand shimmering, and you smell the odor of bread and uh, incense and lamp oil. There are no windows in this section, 
So the light was provided by the lampstand, which was made of one central lamp shaft or pedestal and six branches, three branches on either side. So altogether, there were seven lamps providing light for the holy place. In the outer court, the light came from the sun. In the holy place, the light comes from the golden lampstand. In the holy of holies, the light was supernatural. It came from God. He was the light. You see, there's something comforting and relaxing about this holy place we're in at the moment. But there's also something majestic. You sense, sense that this is truly a holy place. God is here. As already mentioned, there are three pieces of furniture in this room, and each has a sacred purpose. To your right is the table of showbread. Immediately opposite, on your left, is the golden lampstand. And in front, at the back, back of the room, standing in front of the veil that separates the holy place from the holy of holies, is the altar of incense. At different times, it is your responsibility now as a priest to tend the lampstand, to change the bread on the table of showbread, and place incense on the altar. And you know that what you are doing in this room is a special service to God. Have you ever wondered this morning how important light is? Whether it be light found in your room, in your home, whether it be the street lights when you're driving at night, whether that light comes from the sun, the moon, the stars, or even the light that makes it possible for certain outside events to take place in the evening, like sporting events. How many of us have stumbled, tripped, fallen, banged our legs, and even injured ourselves because it was dark and we couldn't see clearly? Light is important for sight, but light is also important for growth. In order for plants and vegetables to grow, one of the ingredients they need is light. Plant nurseries can go out of business because the owners don't understand what kind of light is important for the well-being of, of the individual species of plants that they're growing. Plants can die without the proper amount of light. Light is really important. Just think what life would be like without light. One of the pieces of furniture in the holy place was the golden lampstand, which is the object of our study or our sermon today. We read about it in Exodus 25, verse 31 to 40, and it's, it's got tremendous symbolism. We're not going to read that passage, but if you want to go home, you can read it. The priest had to tend it every morning and evening so that the rest of the room, the rest of the holy place was never in darkness. Every morning and every evening, the job of a priest was to make sure its lamp const was constantly filled with oil and that its wicks were, were replaced and, were, the, and when they didn't burn down, that they were changed so that there was always light in the holy place. As I begin to introduce to you the three main tr truths I want to communicate to you this morning, I want to start by asking and answering the following question. What was the purpose of the golden lampstand? Now the problem with typology is that you can almost make anything say what you want it to say. So you can be very, very careful. It's easy to read into things and into items and spiritualize them when they were never meant to be spiritualized. Today I could spend a lot of time looking at the golden lampstand in detail. We could look at its workmanship, its beauty, its decoration, how it was made and its formation, all which is very interesting and informative and may or may not be have spiritual symbolism. But today I want to keep it simple. I want to highlight what the foundational and real purpose of the lampstand was and is, of which there is no dispute or no controversy. What was the purpose of the golden lampstand? 
The purpose of the lampstand was to illuminate just like a light or candle would today. That was the purpose. Very simple. It was to bring light. The purpose was to give light. To shed light into this room that, so that one could see. Without the golden lampstand, the priests would not be able to do their job because they'd be working in the dark. The light from the lampstand enlightened, enlightened the holy place so that the priests could fellowship with God and intercede on behalf of God's people. The purpose was to shine. It was to give light. It was more to do with usefulness than beauty. With this thought in mind, I want to share with you three truths that this teaches us. And the first one is this. Three truths this teaches us. The first one is I'd like to mention today, God's Word is a lamp. God's Word is a lamp. The Bible that you hold in your hands is a light. Psalm 119 verse 105 declares, Your word is a lamp to my feet and light for my path. Later on in verse 130 it says, The unfolding of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. Do you realize that without God's word we, couldn't, we wouldn't know anything about Jesus? We wouldn't, know, we wouldn't know about his life. We wouldn't know about his ministry. We wouldn't know about his death burial and resurrection we wouldn't know about the prophecies that declared he would come and do all that he did the book you hold in your hands is pure and undefiled as the gold that formed the lampstand and its light makes it possible to see and understand what God has done for us in it, he reveals himself to us. In it, he teaches us what he wants us to do. In it, he shows us his love, mercy, and grace. Now, this subject of God's word is a whole subject all of itself. Let me quickly highlight some of the important aspects of God's word. First of all, it's our spiritual food for spiritual growth. It's like milk for babies. Like newborn babies, the Bible says, crave pure spiritual milk so that you may know, grow, grow up in your salvation. It's like bread for the hungry. It takes more than bread to stay alive. It takes a steady stream from words from God's mouth. It's like milk or, or solid food for the mature. But solid food is for the mature, the Bible says, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from he evil. And for those who like a dessert, it's like honey for the dessert. How sweet are your promises to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. It's like water that quenches our thirst and washes us clean. A life-giving, refreshing, cleansing agent. How can a young man keep his way pure, the Bible says, by living according to your word? Jesus said, you are clean through the word I have spoken to you. It's, it's the seed that God gives us that produces the new birth. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be kind of the kind of first fruits of all he created. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. It's when God's word is planted in our lives that we are changed. Elsewhere it's described like a costly gem, like a rock, a firm foundation upon which we are to build our lives. A fire and a hammer that breaks the, breaks the rock in pieces. A mirror that reveals our true condition. A sword to use in the spiritual battle we are engaged in. A surgeon's scalpel for healing and putting right what is wrong. And when applied and received, it can help us live a spiritual health, in spiritual health. In conclusion, of this point, let me bring it all together by saying, as I mentioned right at the beginning, Psalm 119 verse says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. The Living Bible says, Your words are a flashlight to light the path ahead of me and keep me from stumbling. Psalm 43 verse 3, Send forth your light, your truth. Let them guide me. Ignore and neglect to practically apply the word of God to your life and it is certain sooner or later you will stumble and fall. 
ignore and neglect to practically apply God's word to your life and it is certain sooner or later you will stumble and fall. Like the golden lampstand that gives light, God's word is a light. If and when applied, it is our spiritual food. By it we grow spiritually. If and when applied, it washes us and keeps us clean. It's a life-giving, refreshing, cleansing agent. If and when applied, it, 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 it will form a foundation which we can place our trust and build our life upon. If and when applied, it helps us know victory over the devil's schemes. If and well, well, when applied, it is our compass that guides us and directs us through the spiritual journey of life. Second truth I want to share with you is Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light. In John 8 verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Later on, he says in chapter 12 verse 46, he says, I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. In the book of Revelation, we're told that there will be no need for outside lights there. Jesus will be the only light that we will need. The Lamb will be the light. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. In John 8 and John 12, which I just quoted, Jesus challenges us, challenges us and invites us to follow him and believe in him with the promise that when a person does, they won't walk in darkness but we'll have the light of life. How does a person follow Jesus? What does it mean to follow Jesus? The word follow there was used in different ways by Greek writers. For instance, it was used as a soldier following his captain in battle. On the long marches into battle or, in cam or to campaigns in strange lands, the soldier followed wherever the captain led. Can I say today, just in case there's anybody where this applies, if you want to experience the light and life that only God can give you, you need to be like a good soldier and follow Jesus as your commander. You need to, you need to make Jesus the captain and commander of your life. It's also used as a slave following his master. Wherever the master goes, the slave was, would be in attendance, always ready to spring into action and perform a duty or task. He is, the mas he is at the master's beck and call. Friend, if you want this morning to experience the light and life that only God can give you, you need to be like a servant who makes Jesus his master and Lord. And thirdly, it's used as someone following or accepting wise person, pers a wise person's counsel. Just as Plato, Aristotle, Aristotle, and Socrates had their followers who followed their counsel, one of the titles of Jesus is Wonderful Counselor. And if you want to experience the light and life that only God can give you, you need to follow the counsel of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things he said was, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. In another place, he said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Do you remember the day when you first saw the light? When you first received the light? The th third truth I want to share with you is this. The Christian believer is to be a reflector of the light. The Christian believer is to be a reflector of the light. Turn with me to Matthew 5, verse 14 to 16, if you've got your Bibles. And we're going to draw these thoughts to a conclusion by just looking at these verses. Matthew 5, verse 14 to 16, this is what it says. Now you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Once a person becomes a Christian, 
we are given the role of reflecting Jesus' light. Jesus gives us the role of being light in this dark world. In fact, if this isn't our role, in fact, it's not just a role, it's actually a command. Jesus commands us to be lights in the world, to be reflectors of Jesus' light. How much we need that today. Because the truth is that in many areas of church, in many areas of the church, it's, we're not being felt by society. The way that we should be. There are many reasons why that is so, but one reason stands far above the rest. The church has lost its influence because Christians have neglected their responsibility to be salt and light in the world. If we don't be what God has called us to be, the world is going to ignore us. But when, but when the Christian decides to be salt and light... The world will pay close attention to what we say and what we do. Let me say it simply. When we are are salt and light, the world listens to us. When we aren't, they don't. The question we must ask ourselves is this. What must I do? What must we do to to let our light shine? And I'm going to give you at least three things very quickly that we must do And we must understand. The first of all is this. First of all, we must have a connection with the source of light. We must have a connection with the source of light. Jesus is the light. Mankind as a whole is in darkness. Jesus is the real light of the world. Those who follow Jesus actually become reflectors of his light, or at least should do. Jesus, just as the sun is the source of, of, of light in our universe and the moon reflects the light to the, of the sun, Jesus is the source of light and the world and we, his followers, are to reflect that light. One day a religious education teacher was about to dismiss the class and he asked, are there any questions before we go? A student's hands went up and he said, I'd like to know what is the meaning of life? The teacher reached into his back pocket and took out his wallet. Out of the wallet, he took a little mirror about the size of a ten-pence piece. Then he told his story. He says, when I was a child, I began to realize that I could could have so much fun with that mirror. I would simply catch the glint of the sun and shine that mirror into an otherwise darkened place. As I grew older, I began began to learn that this is no child's toy. This little piece of mirror is really a metaphor of my life. Now I am not the light, he says. I am not the source of light. I am simply a broken mirror fragment. But if I allow the sun to shine on my mirror, it's amazing what light I can bring into the darkness. He said, ladies and gentlemen, that is the meaning of life. If you are a a believer this morning... We are not the light. We are not the source of light. But when we let the Son, Jesus Christ, into our lives, when we are connected to the source of life, then we become reflectors of light. There's only one way we can be reflectors of light, and that is to have a connection with the source. In other words, we must know the light of the world personally. We must have a relationship with him. We must be in love with him. We must be following him. He must be our master, captain, and Lord. So the first thing is we must have a connection to the source of light. And secondly, we must realize that like it or not, our life is on display. Like it or not, our life is on display. Every person we come into contact with will make a judgment about us. Every person you meet will make a judgment about you. They will have an opinion of what they think about you. They will listen to what you say. They will watch the way that you live and the things you do. That's the case for everyone, actually, non-Christian and Christian. Whoever you meet, you decide to make a, a judgment or you make an opinion about them by the way that they live. 
But for the Christian, this is especially the case. The moment someone finds out about our Christian faith, the more our life is on display and it's essential that we live lives that are blameless. It's essential that the fruit of the Spirit is being manifested in our character and the way that we live. Ephesians 5 verse 8 puts it like this, For you were once in darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. As individuals, we need to be light in darkness. At school, at work, in the home, you may be the only light around. So don't hide it under a bush. Let it shine. Keep burning brightly. Never let it burn out. Those that know the Lord are to shine in the midst of darkness. If our faith doesn't make a difference in the way that we live our lives, we need to repent and get right with God. If our life, the life that we live, doesn't make a difference in the way that we live, we need to repent and get right with God and allow the light of Jesus to shine through. Young boy, about nine years of age, went with his parents to Europe one summer. Part of their holiday involved visiting some of the great cathedrals of the past. As he visited cathedral after cathedral, he saw the massive stained glass portraits of the disciples and the saints in the window. He was impressed as he stood in these great empty halls, looking through the beautiful stained glass windows. Upon his return, he was asked by his Sunday school teacher what he liked best about the great cathedrals in Europe. He thought for a moment and said, I love the beauty and the majesty of these great buildings and the colorful stained glass portraits of the saints in the windows. His Sunday school teacher then asked what his definition of a saint was. As his mind thought of the massive, beautiful stained glass windows, he said, a saint is a person that the light shines through. A saint is a person that the light shines through. Notice in Matthew 5, the simple application of verse 16. Let your light shine before men. The key phrase is before men. You can turn on a light in an empty room and it will dispel the darkness, but it won't affect anybody. Because nobody's there. Likewise, you can live the Christian life in secret, but no no one is going to be helped. If our light is going to shine... It's going to have to shine before men. Secondly, somebody has, 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 has to see it before it do, does any good. And my third point is, is, finally, we must realize that our light is seen through our good works. Verse 16 says, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, don't shy away from that phrase, good works. The phrase is used over 20 times in the New Testament. Every time it's used in a favorable way. And while it is true that good works do not earn us salvation, once we are saved, it is a sign on the, of the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In, this, in his letter to Ephesians, Paul reminds the believers in chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. A student took his car to the garage and told the mechanic something's wrong. I don't have any lights. The mechanic suggested it's it's possibly the battery. The battery's dead. No, the student explained, my horn still blows. It can't be the battery. The mechanic replied, it can still be a battery because it takes more power to give light than it does to blow the horn. Interesting thought. It's easier to toot than to shine. It's easier to blow your horn than to shine. 
It takes more power to shine than to shout. It's not so much what you say that counts. It's where our actions prove that we are. Jesus said two things would happen when we shine our light. First, men will see our good deeds. The word good means attractive, lovely, beautiful. It's that which is pleasing to the eye. Jesus is saying that people will be attracted by the beauty of our life. When we do good deeds, it is beautiful, attractive, and lovely. It's evangelism backed up by action. Jesus could have said, when they hear your great preachers, or when they sit in your lovely churches, or when they hear you, hear your, 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 hear your, hear your wonderful singing, he could have said that, but he didn't. He simply said, when they see the way that you live. Perhaps you've heard this poem, it's called The Living Sermon. And it drives the point home with crystal clarity. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely tell the way. The best of all preachers are the men who live their creeds. For to see good put in action is what everybody needs. The lectures you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might understand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. The second thing that will happen when we shine our lights before men is they will give God the credit. They will give God the credit. Verse 16 says, They praise your Father in heaven. Have you noticed the word you, your there is mentioned three times? Your light, your good deeds, your Father in heaven, yours, mine. Three times, yours, mine. When we let our life, our light shine before men, they glorify our Father in heaven. What begins on earth ends in heaven. We can point men to God by our doing good, by our good deeds. And we have people come to the food bank. We make it very clear we're a Christian organization. We always give them a piece of literature when they leave. And if they're willing, if they want prayer, we'll pray for them. And prayer might be the first step on the way through a person becoming a Christian. It's wonderfully simple. We do the shining, God gets the credit. That's not bad, is it? And here's why. Light does not call attention to itself. It provides illumination so that other things can be seen as they really are. When Robert Louis Stevenson, I'm nearly finished, was a young child, he was sick much more than, m most of the time. He couldn't go out and play like the other children, so he would spend a lot of time watching out through his window. One evening, he sat and watched as the old-fashioned lamplighter came down the street lightening the lamps. His nurse said to him, what are you doing? To which he replied, I'm watching the man knock holes in the darkness. Friends, the dark of the night the brighter the light shines. It is precisely when the world is at its worst that the people of God should be at their best. We are made for days like these. I believe that with all my life. Uh, I believe we are made for days like these. In the society and the econ economic climate that we are living in today, we are made for days like these. And this is our calling. We have been commissioned by Jesus Christ to go throughout our areas of influence, knocking holes in the darkness. This world desperately needs light. 
the light of the gospel. And one way it can be communicated is through reflecting Christ, who Christ is, and the light of the world in the good deeds and the things that we, do, we say and perform. Let's not hide our light under a bowl, but let's illuminate the spiritual darkness around us by the boldness of our speech and the beauty of our life. That certainly involves deeds of everyday kindness. It may mean going out of your way to help a friend. It, it no doubt involves uh, uh, openly identifying yourself as a Christian and taking some criticism for your faith as you, as you live in an unpopular and stand out on certain moral issues. It will mean that. That's the price we're going to have to pay for to knock holes in the darkness. Probably cost you some money. And some time. But when you do, they won't talk so much about you. They'll talk about Jesus. We can't do everything. But we can do something. And what we can do, we ought to do. That is what being salt and light is all about. The purpose of the golden lampstand was to bring light into what would be a darkened place. Without the light, the priests would not be able to perform their duties. The light needed to shine so that they could see what they were doing and be effective in their service. The light of God's word has the same purpose. It will guide you. God's word will direct you. It will enable you to be the person you should be. God wants you to, to accept it, to believe it, and apply it. Jesus is the light of the world. He is the ultimate source of light and life. Without him, you will remain in darkness. You will remain in your sin to know life, real life, to know the peace of God, to know forgiveness of sins. You must accept him and follow him as Lord, and there's no other way, by the way. And finally, for those of you who are believers, we are called to be reflectors of the light. We are to reflect the light of Jesus Christ in the way we live, in the things that we say, in the way we, li we, we live, and the good works that we perform. God's word is light. Jesus is the light. And we are reflectors of the light. Let's pray, shall we?